Listening section directions measures your ability to understand conversations and lectures in English. You will hear each conversation and lecture only one time. After each conversation or lecture, you will hear some questions about it. Answer all questions based on what the speakers state or imply. You may take notes while you listen. You may use your notes to help you answer the questions. Most questions have four possible answers. In some questions, you will see this icon. This means that you will hear but not see part of the question. Some questions have special directions, which appear in a gray box. Most questions are worth one point. If a question is worth more than one point, special direct more than one point, special directions will indicate how many points you can receive. You have approximately forty minutes to complete the listening section. This includes the time for listening to the conversations and lectures, and for answering the questions. To make this practice more like the real test, cover the questions and answers during each conversation and lecture. When you hear the first question, uncover the questions and answers. Questions one through five between a student and a music professor. Hi, Professor Casey. How are you? Fine, thanks, Michael. I heard you got the scholarship for the summer program at Silverwood. Congratulations! Thank you. I mean, thank you very much. I'm sure your recommendation helped me a lot. I was happy to do it. So, are you ready for summer? I wish it was next week, but I、uh, still have a lot to do before exams. But I'm looking forward to it. I'll be studying oboe with Peter Stanley. He heads the woodwind ensemble there. I know him. You couldn't ask for a better teacher. That's great. I'm really happy for you. Thanks. I'm looking forward to it. He was on the panel for my interview. I'll be studying oboe with him and also orchestra. Dr. Fine is the conductor, and I'm hoping to do the French horn too, and maybe take up the crumb horn horn too, and maybe take up the crumb horn. It's such a cool sound. They're supposed to have an early music specialist there, but I forgot her name. The crumb horn. Yeah. That's right. You did tell me of your interest in medieval and Renaissance music. I hope you get a chance to pursue that. There's been a revival of interest there. Well, Michael, it looks like you'll have a full plate this summer. I know. I'm sure I'll be working hard, but it'll be great. So, what comes after that? What are your plans for next year? You'll be a sophomore, right? Right. I'll be coming back here, so I'm sure I'll be seeing you. You'll still be teaching theory and composition, right? Of course, I will, and I look forward to having you in class. What will you be doing this summer? I'll be teaching theory one and two, and coaching voice. Uh huh. You're also in a band, aren't you? I mean, outside of school. Yes, I am a jazz quintet. We do mostly standards. I play piano and sing. For me, that's fun and relaxation time. My girlfriend said she heard you at the back alley. Yes, we play there every Wednesday night. You should come hear us sometime. I like that. I'll bring my girlfriend. She says you are really good. Well, then, I hope to see you some Wednesday night. I'll be there. Well. I gotta go now. I'm supposed to meet my German teacher in 15 minutes. And thanks again for the recommendation. It's my pleasure, Michael. You'll make the most of it, I'm certain. Good luck. Number one. What topics do the speakers mainly discuss? Number two. What does the professor mean when she says this? I know him. You couldn't ask for a better teacher. Number three. Why does the professor say this? Well, Michael, it looks like you'll have a full plate this summer. Number four. What does the professor do for relaxation? Number five. What can be inferred from the conversation?
Questions 6 through 11 in a film studies class. In the first two decades of the 20th century, cinema established itself as a powerful mass medium. Movies were a popular entertainment for working people, but they were more than just entertainment. Movies were also regarded as high art by the intellectuals of the day. Many people believed that cinema, or film, would be the defining art form of the new century. Even in its earliest years, film was developing its own style, a style that was distinct from that of the theater. But what do we mean when we speak of film style? To put it simply, style is the texture of a film's images and sounds. It's the filmmaker's, it's the filmmaker's systematic use of the techniques of the medium. For example, staging, lighting, performance, camera framing, and focus. Editing and sound also contribute to style. A few filmmakers of the silent era were already developing film style, most notably in the editing technique of cutting. Cutting is when the action is broken up into separate shots or pieces of film, and then the shots are recombined to tell the story in a coherent way. Before cutting, the action in films was like it was in the theater. The action took place far away from us, and it was continuous. It wasn't interrupted by any closer views of the actors. Early film critics didn't like films that looked too much like theater. Theater was a well-recognized art form with its own traditions and methods. However, film was something new, and, well, it was an art form that owed its birth to the technology of the moving picture camera. The critics preferred to see stylistic camera work and editing, the techniques that set film apart from theater. A lot of critics felt that editing was the most important film technique. Cutting, the change from shot to shot, was regarded as the key to film artistry. Another film technique, called cross-cutting, made it possible to tell two stories at the same time. Cross-cutting, it's also called parallel action, it involves showing segments from two different sequences, moving back and forth from one to the other, so the two stories appear to be taking place at the same time. Cross-cutting was used in the 1903 film, The Great Train Robbery. The film shows bandits escaping from the scene of their crime, and then it cross-cuts to a scene where the townspeople are dancing at a party, unaware the robbery has taken place. The audience easily understands that the two scenes are going on at the same time. The person who usually receives the credit for inventing most film techniques is D.W. Griffith. While Griffith didn't invent everything about film, actually he defined and redefined the innovations of other filmmakers, he created movies that critics and audiences recognized as a unique narrative form. This is because he perfected the elements of film grammar and the art of the story film. Instead of having one camera shoot a scene from one position, D.W. Griffith filmed each scene from many angles, and then he pieced together the sequences in the editing room. He used editing to heighten and control the dramatic impact of a scene. He introduced analytical editing, that is, breaking down a scene into shots that show closer views of people's faces or gestures. These closely framed shots are known as close-ups. The close-up conveys a character's emotions through subtle changes in the eyes, mouth, and brow. After D.W. Griffith, the close-up became a standard tool in the language of film. Number 6. What is the lecture mainly about? Number 7. Which of the following contribute to the style of a film? Number 8. According to the professor, why did early film critics dislike films that resembled theater?
Number nine. Why does the professor discuss cross-cutting? Number ten. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. The person who usually receives the credit for inventing most film techniques is D. W. Griffith. While Griffith didn't invent everything about film, actually he defined and redefined the innovations of other filmmakers. He created movies that critics and audiences recognized as a unique narrative form. This is because he perfected the elements of film grammar and the art of the story film. What does the professor mean when he says this? This is because he perfected the elements of film grammar and the art of the story film. Number eleven. Which camera shot would probably best show that a character is frightened? Questions twelve through seventeen talk in a biology class. Until recently, we knew almost nothing about how important bees are in maintaining natural diversity. Now we know more about them. We know, for example, that honeybees are the dominant pollinators because they play a role in pollinating four out of five food crops in North America. We also know that honeybees, along with the other insects, bats, and birds that transfer pollen between flowers, all together they contribute more than ten billion dollars a year to fruit and seed production on North American farms. Pollination is one of nature's services to farmers. So think about this: if you eliminated the pollinators, it would take the food right out of our mouths. The food right out of our mouths. We biologists never imagined we'd see the day when wild plants or crops suffered from pollinator scarcity, but unfortunately, that day has come. In fact, farmers in Mexico and the U.S. are suffering the worst pollinator crisis in history. So, what happened? Any ideas, Alicia? Is it、um, because of natural enemies? I read something about a kind of parasite that's killed lots of bees. It's true. An outbreak of parasitic mites has caused a steep decline in North American populations of honeybees, but parasites aren't the only factor. What about the pesticides used on farms? All those chemicals must have an effect. Most definitely, yes. Pesticides are a major factor. Both wild and domesticated bees are in serious trouble because of pesticides. In California, farm chemicals are killing around 10 percent of all the honeybee colonies. Agriculture, in general, is part of the problem. Think about this for a minute: the North American continent is a vast collection of nectar corridors made up of flowering plants. These corridors stretch for thousands of miles from Mexico to as far north as Alaska. And every year, there's an array of migratory pollinators flying north and south with the seasons, following the flowers. The migratory corridors, the flyways, are like、uh, something like a path of stepping stones for the pollinators, with each stone being a collection of flowering plants. But our system of large-scale agriculture has interfered. During the past 50 years, millions of acres of desert in western Mexico and the southwestern United States have been turned into chemically intensive farms, planted with exotic grasses, creating huge stretches of flyway that are devoid of nectar-producing plants for migratory pollinators. What we have now are huge gaps between the stepping stones, patches of plants here and there. A couple of migratory pollinators are worth noting. One is the lesser long-nosed bat, and another is the most famous pollinator. What is our most famous pollinator, or should I say, our most beautiful pollinator? Oh, I know. It's the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly. Yes, 
Millions of monarchs from all over the U.S. and southern Canada fly south every year in late summer. The monarch is the only butterfly that returns to a specific site year after year. Unfortunately, the herbicides used on the milkweed in the Great Plains are taking a toll on monarchs, and fewer of them are reaching their winter grounds in Mexico. Another important pollinator is the long-nosed bat. These amazing animals feed on cactus flowers. What they do is they lap up the nectar at the bottom of the flower, and then when the bat flies off to another cactus, the pollen stuck to its head is transferred to that plant's flower. But the long-nosed bat is having a tough time too. Some desert ranchers mistake them for vampire bats, and they've tried to poison them or dynamite the caves where they roost. Number twelve. What is the talk mainly about? Number thirteen. According to the professor, what factors have affected pollinator populations? Number fourteen. Listen again to part of the talk, then answer the question. But our system of large-scale agriculture has interfered. During the past fifty years, millions of acres of desert in western Mexico and the southwestern United States have been turned into chemically intensive farms, planted with exotic grasses, creating huge stretches of flyway that are devoid of nectar-producing plants for migratory pollinators. What we have now are huge gaps between the stepping stones. Patches of plants here and there. Why does the professor say this? What we have now are huge gaps between the stepping stones. Patches of plants here and there. Number fifteen. Listen again to part of the talk. Then answer the question. Millions of monarchs from all over the U.S. and southern Canada fly south every year in late summer. The monarch is the only butterfly that returns to a specific site year after year. Unfortunately, the herbicides used on the milkweed in the Great Plains are taking a toll on monarchs, and fewer of them are reaching their winter grounds in Mexico. What can be inferred about monarch butterflies? Numbers sixteen and seventeen, based on the information in the talk, indicate whether each sentence below describes the honeybee, the monarch butterfly, or the long-nosed bat. Questions eighteen through twenty. Historian has been invited to speak to an urban studies class. Listen to part of the lecture. The agricultural revolution of ten thousand years ago started the great shift from rural to urban living. As human settlements evolved from simple groups of huts to larger villages, and then to towns and cities, their basic pattern changed. The early rural villages grew naturally, sort of organically, as if they were plants or bushes, and buildings were clustered near water sources and around village gardens, with trees for shade and pastures for animals. A lot of us yearn to escape to these simpler, more romantic settlements of the past, but there are probably more of us who have a powerful urge to explore. More of us who have a powerful urge to explore new ideas and to build bigger and better structures. We now have super settlements called cities. Our city planners and architects have converted the organic pattern of the village into a geometrically perfect grid. 
Our natural habitat has been transformed into an expanse of hard, straight surfaces with stone and metal and concrete and glass. Of course, the city is still a wonderful place for stimulation, for opportunity, and for cultural interaction. In fact, you could say the city is our most spectacular creation. And believe it or not, it still has elements of the rural past. In the average North American city, about one-third of the surface is given to streets and buildings. The rest is covered by trees and grass. Foresters call it the urban forest, meaning all the trees in city parks, the trees planted along streets and highways, and the trees in people's yards. The extent of this forest is sort of amazing, two-thirds of our urban space. The concept of a tree-lined village green has a long history, but one of North America's first public parks that was sort of created as a unified project was Central Park in New York City. Central Park was designed by landscape architects Olmsted and Vox in the late 19th century. They took their inspiration from the gardens of European estates and the romantic landscape paintings from that period. Central Park was set in a rectangular site covering over 800 acres in the middle of Manhattan Island. By the 19th century, the original forest was long gone. The area had been used as a common pasture for farm animals, but eventually it deteriorated into a kind of urban wasteland dotted with garbage dumps. Olmsted and Vox transformed this wasteland into something like its original appearance, with rolling hills, grassy meadows, and woody thickets with thousands of trees. The result is sort of an oasis in the middle of steel and stone. Central Park has been called the city's lung because of its purifying effect on the air, not to mention its effect on the human psyche. It remains one of the best examples of what we can do with the open spaces of our cities. When you look at how far we've come as humans, when you consider that we've developed something called civilization, you come to realize that the finest evidence of our civilization is the city. The city is a symbol of experimentation and creation, a place where we can come together for work and entertainment, for art and culture, for wonder and opportunity. And like the rural villages of the past, the city is where we come together to share cultural experiences with other humans, indeed to define what it is to be human. Number 18. What topics does the speaker discuss? Number 19. How did early rural villages differ from the cities of today? Number 20. What is the urban forest? Number 21. Why does the speaker talk about New York City? Number 22. Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. Olmsted and Vox transformed this wasteland into something like its original appearance, with rolling hills, grassy meadows, and woody thickets with thousands of trees. The result is sort of an oasis in the middle of steel and stone. Central Park has been called the city's lung because of its purifying effect on the air, not to mention its effect on the human psyche. It remains one of the best examples of what we can do with the open spaces of our cities. What does the speaker imply about New York's Central Park? Number 23. What is the speaker's opinion of the city?
Questions 24 through 20. A discussion between a student and her tutor. My first test in computer science is on Monday, and I'm sure there'll be a question about memory. So can we go over memory again? Sure. Just remember the term memory is used a bit loosely. It describes an important element inside the system unit, the part of your computer where information is stored. Technically, memory can be either of two things, RAM or ROM. RAM and ROM, two kinds of memory. I need to be able to explain them. Now, what's the difference between RAM and ROM? RAM, or random access memory, stores the programs and data you're using in your current work session. When you turn off the computer, the information in RAM is lost. ROM, read-only memory, stores the information your computer needs to perform basic functions. Computer needs to perform basic functions and run programs that are built into your computer. Like the program to start up the computer, ROM is permanent memory. Okay. You said RAM stores the programs and the data. Okay, then what does the hard disk store? I guess I don't understand the difference between the memory and the disk storage. That's a really good question. I'll answer it with an analogy. Uh, imagine you're at the library doing research for a new product your company wants to make. You found a cabinet of 100 file folders with all the information you need. You also have five sheets of instructions from your boss on how to use the information. So what do you do? You sit down at a table, open several folders, and lay out only the instruction sheet you need for this part of the research. After all, the library table is only so big. When you finish gathering data from the first set of folders, you put them back and get another bunch. Similarly, when you complete the first page of your boss's instructions, you put that page back in your briefcase and pull out another page. Now, which part of your computer's memory is sort of like the library table? RAM? That's right, RAM. Why is that? Because RAM stores only the program and data I need for this part of my work. RAM is sort of my work area, the tabletop. It's what I use when I work with files in a program. That's right. And what are the 100 file folders? I get it now. The file folders are the disk storage. In a program, when I ask for another file, the computer gets it from the disk the file cabinet, and loads it into RAM. What I mean is it sort of puts the file on my work table. That's right. And by keeping in RAM only the file needed for your current work session, you can work much faster and more efficiently. When you're finished, before you leave the library, you clear the table and return all the folders to the cabinet. It's exactly like what the computer does. When you finish your work session on the computer, all the files are returned to disk storage. Number 24. What is the purpose of the discussion? Number 25. Where does the computer store information to run programs that are built in? Number 26. Why does the tutor describe doing research at the library? Number 27. In the tutor's analogy, what does the library table represent? Number 28. The tutor briefly describes what happens during a work session on the computer. Indicate whether each sentence below is a step in the process. Questions 29 through 34 lecture in a United States history class. The battle at Antietam Creek in 1862 was the bloodiest 24 hours of the Civil War. Nearly 8,000 men lost their lives, and another 15,000 were severely wounded. No single day in American history has been as tragic. 
Antietam was memorable in another way, too. It saw the advent of the war photographer. The best-known pictorial records of the Civil War are the photographs commissioned by Matthew Brady, a leading portrait photographer of the time. Brady owned studios in New York and in Washington and was known for his portraits of political leaders and celebrities. At the outbreak of the Civil War, at the outbreak of the Civil War, he turned his attention to the conflict. He wanted to document the war on a grand scale, so he hired 20 photographers and sent them into the field with the troops. The battlefield carried dangers and financial risks, but Brady was persistent. Brady himself did not actually shoot many of the photographs that bore his name. His company of photographers took the vast majority of the pictures, images of camp life, artillery, fortifications, railroads, bridges, battlefields, officers, and ordinary soldiers. Brady was more of a project manager. He spent his time supervising his photographers, preserving their negatives, and buying negatives from other photographers. Two days after the battle at Antietam, two photographers from Brady's New York Gallery took a series of photographs that ushered in a new era in the visual documentation of war. This was the first time that cameras had been allowed near the action before the fallen bodies of the dead were removed. Within a month of the battle, the images of battlefield corpses from Antietam were on display at Brady's Gallery in New York. A sign on the door said simply, The Dead of Antietam. America was shocked. The exhibition marked the first time most people had ever seen the carnage of the war. The photographs had a sensational impact, opening people's eyes as no woodcuts or lithographs had ever done. The New York Times wrote, If Mr. Brady has not brought bodies and laid them at our dooryards, he has done something very like it. Thousands of people, especially mothers and wives of men serving in the Union forces, flocked to look at these first dramatic images of death and destruction. Suddenly, the battlefield was no longer comfortably distant. The camera was bringing it closer, erasing romantic notions about war. Matthew Brady's work was the first instance of the comprehensive photo documentation of a war, the Civil War, which as a result became the first media war. Photography had come of age, although it was still a relatively new technology with several limitations. For example, the exposure time of the camera was slow, and negatives had to be prepared minutes before a shot and developed immediately afterwards. This meant that it was not possible for photographers to take action pictures. They were limited to taking pictures of the battlefield after the fighting was over. Another limitation was that newspapers couldn't yet reproduce photographs. They could print only artist drawings of the scene. Nevertheless, photography made a huge impact, and media coverage of war and public opinion about war would never be the same again. Number 29. What is the main idea of the lecture? Number 30. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. The battle at Antietam Creek in 1862 was the bloodiest 24 hours of the Civil War. Nearly 8,000 men lost their lives, and another 15,000 were severely wounded. No single day in American history has been as tragic. What does the professor mean by this statement? No single day in American history has been as tragic. Number 31. Who was Matthew Brady? Number 32. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. 
Within a month of the battle, the images of battlefield corpses from Antietam were on display at Brady's Gallery in New York. A sign on the door said simply, The Dead of Antietam. America was shocked. The exhibition marked the first time most people had ever seen the carnage of the war. The photographs had a sensational impact, opening people's eyes as no woodcuts or lithographs had ever done. Why does the professor say this? The photographs had a sensational impact, opening people's eyes as no woodcuts or lithographs had ever done. Number 33. What were some of the limitations of photography during the Civil War? Number 34. What does the professor imply about Matthew Brady? Speaking section, direct. Speaking section measures your ability to speak in English about a variety of topics. There are six questions in this section. Record your response to each question on a cassette. Questions 1 and 2 are independent speaking tasks in which you will speak about familiar topics. Your responses will be scored on your ability to speak clearly and coherently about the topics. Questions 3 and 4 are integrated tasks in which you will read a passage, listen to a conversation or lecture, and then speak in response to a question about what you have read and heard. You will need to combine relevant information from the two sources to answer the question completely. Your responses will be scored on your ability to speak clearly and, or on your ability to speak clearly and coherently. And on your ability to accurately convey information about what you read and heard. Questions 5 and 6 are integrated tasks in which you will listen to part of a conversation or lecture and then speak in response to a question about what you have heard. Your responses will be scored on your ability to speak clearly and coherently and on your ability to accurately convey information about what you heard. You will hear each conversation and lecture only one time. You may take notes while you listen. You may use your notes to help you answer the questions. Describe an event such as a holiday celebrating. Explain why the event is significant to you. Include details and examples to support your explanation. Some people keep in touch with frail. Others keep in touch by telephone. Which method do you prefer to use and why? Include details and examples in your explanation. Now listen to two students in section. What do you think of the new requirement? Starting next quarter, we need a discussion section for every lecture course we take. It sounds like something I'm okay with. Oh, I think it's just a bother. We already have three hours of lecture every week. But that's not enough. The professor never covers everything we need to know for the examination, and there's hardly any time to ask questions. Oh, but you can ask the professor questions during office hours. Have you ever actually tried to do that? Some professors are never in their office, and the ones who are, well, they're usually too busy to talk to students. I like the idea of a discussion section. It gives us more of a chance to talk to the teacher and other students, too. Lecture classes are so big that you never get to know your classmates. Discussion classes have only around, discussion classes have only around 20 or 25 people, and that's really nice. It's a lot more personal and informal, and you can learn so much more. Besides, it's easy to get a high grade in the discussion section. The man expresses his opinion about the required discussion section. State his opinion and explain the reasons he gives for holding that opinion. Now listen to part of a lecture in a.
One example of a homeostatic system is temperature control, by which some animals can maintain a constant internal body temperature. The large ears of a rabbit are an amazing device in homeostasis. The rabbit can regulate the amount of blood flowing through blood vessels of its big ears. This adjusts heat loss to the rabbit's surroundings and maintains the stability of the rabbit's body temperature. The control center for body temperature is the brain, and nerve cells in the skin do much of the work. Here's what happens. When the rabbit's body temperature increases because of exercise or hot surroundings, the rabbit's brain notices the change, and it sets out to bring the temperature back to normal. So the brain turns on the body's cooling, turns on the body's cooling system. In the rabbit's ears, the blood vessels expand and fill with warm blood. Heat is then able to escape from the surface of the skin on the ears, and this causes the rabbit's body temperature to drop, and the brain can then turn off the cooling system. On the other hand, when the rabbit's body temperature decreases because of cold surroundings, the brain turns on the body's warming system. Blood vessels in the ears constrict and get narrow and send blood from the skin to deeper parts of the rabbit's body, and this reduces heat loss from the ears. The professor describes the large ears of a rabbit. Explain how the rabbit's ears are used in homeostasis. Now listen to a conversation between her. May I help you? I hope so. I need to get an official copy of my transcript, but it seems I can't do that because there's an unpaid charge in my student account. The charge is a mistake. It's for a window my roommate broke in our dormitory room. Somehow the charge ended up on my account instead of hers. The problem is, I need my transcript right away because I'm applying for a scholarship. I see. Well, the fastest thing would be for you to just pay the charge to clear your account and then have your roommate pay you back. Or you could send your roommate in to pay it. Can't you just remove the charge from my account? After all, it's the university's mistake. I can't do that until I get approval from the housing office, and that could take a while. But here's what you can do go down the hall, what you can do. Go down the hall right now and talk to the dean's secretary. Tell her what you've told me. She might let us release your transcript now, and then we can worry about the problem on your account later. Describe the woman's problem and the suggestions the man makes about how to deal with it. What do you think the woman should do, and why? Now listen to part of a talk. In a the communication between a baby and a parent, especially the mother, has many of the same features as communication in music. One feature is timing. A mother and a child have a shared sense of timing, both before and after the child is born. It's like the mother and child kind of swing together in a common rhythm. Just as one musician will lead another in a performance, a child will often lead the earliest conversations with his mother. A baby's sounds are conversational in the way that they connect two people in an exchange of sounds. This interplay between mother and child suggests that a child has, from the very beginning, an ability to communicate with his mother. The child recognizes his mother's, vo the child recognizes his mother's voice. He also learns very quickly how to use his own voice in various ways. By the time he's two months old, a baby can make sounds with a musical inflection when he's talking with his mother. The communication between babies and mothers develops from the intense daily contact between them. The mother creates a special language for the child. Baby talk, a very special, very musical language. Several studies show that babies understand the patterns of baby talk and will respond appropriately by using facial expressions, movements, and their voice. Babies quickly develop a large vocabulary of sounds. They learn to make meaningful sounds long before any of these sounds become real words. The meaning lies in the music of the sounds. Different meanings expressed by changes in intonation, rhythm, and timing. Babies learn to adjust their voice to match their mother's voice. They will imitate their mother's speech even after mother has stopped talking. Using points and examples from the talk, 
Describe the communication between babies and mothers. Explain how this communication is musical in nature. Writing section directions measures your ability to use writing to communicate in an academic environment. There are two writing questions. Question one is an integrated writing task. You will read a passage, listen to a lecture, and then answer a question based on what you have read and heard. You have 20 minutes to plan and write your response. Question two is an independent writing task. You will answer a question based on your own knowledge and experience. You have 30 minutes to plan and write your response. Now listen to part of a lecture on this. One area that illustrates the importance of visual spatial intelligence is the game of chess. An important skill for a chess player to have is the ability to predict moves and their consequences before they're made. This ability to plan ahead is closely tied to having a superior visual sense, or visual imagination, as chess players call it. In a form of chess called blindfold chess, a person plays several games at the same time. So, for example, a blindfolded chess player might be playing ten games against ten different opponents, moving from table to table around a room. His opponents can see the chess board, but the blindfolded chess player can't. The blindfolded player can't. The blindfolded player's only information about the chess board is from someone announcing his opponent's last move. So you can see why a strong visual memory is necessary. For most chess players, each chess game has its own character, its own shape, and this makes an impression on the player. The blindfolded player has to remember the positions of the chess pieces, since he can't actually see the chess board. As he tries to recall a given position, he remembers his reasoning at an earlier time, and he remembers a specific move, not all by itself, but uh, instead... He remembers his specific strategy and why that move was necessary. Chess players have strong visual memories of important games they've played in the past. This memory isn't just simple rote recall. It's really the memory of the game's patterns of reasoning. The chess player's memory stores plans and ideas and strategies, not just a rote list of moves. Chess masters have an amazing ability to reconstruct a chessboard they've seen for just a few seconds, if the pieces on the board are set in meaningful positions, as they are in the middle of a real game. But if the chess pieces are randomly located, then they don't have any real meaning, and the chess master may or may not be able to reconstruct the board. Summarize the points made in the lecture, explaining how they illustrate points made in the reading.